person go through the house and kill six people the way they think they were killed. When he told the police that a hooded, black-handed demon came to him and handed him the weapon, but that he didn't move, I believe that it's true. I don't think he was in any condition to move. But the demon that he was talking about was his own sister. Ronnie and his sister Dawn had plotted to kill their parents together. The Dawn de Feo killed the family, and that Ronnie, in despair, murdered Dawn. So he's responsible for one murder. In fact, the jury found Ronald DeFeo to be guilty of all the murders and to be of sound mind. He was given six life sentences in February 1975. So, Mr. DeFeo, tell me what happened. What had happened was Dawn was said something smart. I said, if you want to get rid of Mommy and Daddy, I said, I'll go get you a gun. Well, no, no. I said, in fact, I'll get you a shotgun. How was that? And I went in the room, and I grabbed your gun. So I said, here you go. What do you want me to do with that? I said, it's all ready to go. Just pull a hammer back and squeeze the trigger. The bullet in the chamber. It's all ready to go. <laughs> my mother yelled, oh, my God, Ronnie. Now, my mother went with a hand. My mother went with a hand towards the side of a bed. <laughs> my sister looked at me. I said, are you happy now? Are you happy now? I said to her, she looked at me. She said, oh, oh my God, look what you did. I said, look what I did. I said, this was your idea, not mine. I said, look what I did. I said, mommy got shot on top of it. On the night of the murder, that operative did see Dawn DeFeo wearing a snorkel type jacket and gloves come out of the house with a rifle throw the rifle into the back seat of her car and drive out towards the point where the city has a, a dock, which is exactly where the weapon was found by police divers later on. I left the house and I told my sister, I'll be back, don't do nothing, let me see what we're gonna do. There's things that got to be done, but I gotta get out of here because I can't deal with this. Leave everything alone. That's what I told her. I left the house. Well, I was just driving around, really. It was late. Nobody was up sleeping. I just kept driving and thinking. I was in a fog. I really didn't know what to do. You know, I was really messed up. The more I thought about it, the worse it got. I was driving with the window open. The radio was off. The heat was off. And I was just thinking and driving, thinking and driving, stopping, trying to figure out what I should do, where I should go. Every place I went, it was, you know, was like a telephone, no answer. And I finally came home. When I drove in the driveway, all the lights were on. I walked in the house, they were dawn, dawn, twice. Then I went up the stairs. I went all the way up the stairs. I got to the top, and my sister had a pink shag rug, Allison, in her room. And I looked at her and I looked down, there was blood, a puddle of blood. I said, oh my God. And I, my two brothers' room, I went in there. They were dead. I see a hole in both their backs. I said, oh God. Then I ran upstairs. I didn't put no light on, I ran up the stairs. And Dawn says, oh my God, Butch, what are you doing here? Grabbed the gun, tried to blow my head off. Tried to shoot me, again, it was in my face. So now she's a big girl. I got in a wrestling match with her. But nobody was fell down or anything. I got in a wrestling match with her trying to get this gun away. I had the gun straight up in the air. And I got my left hand trying to do something to her. And I slammed her down in the bed. I grabbed the mall off the floor. And like I said, I hit the lever on the gun. A live round came out of the gun. The gun went off. I thought I shot her in the neck. Maybe 25, 30 seconds went by. Maybe even a minute went by. I just stood there and looked looked at. Why do you think your sister would have done that? I know why. Hate. She hated Allison. Allison was going to broke her up to be a beautiful young girl. She hated that. So you think she was jealous of Allison? I know she was. Now, why would she kill the boys? I mean, think about it. How are you going to explain this the next day? To the kids. 
How are you going to explain what happened? They heard the noise. They heard the gunshots. The neighbors heard the gunshots. So you think it'd be easier to explain with the boys? My down. mother and father, we could have got away with that. I mean, so many people wanted to kill him, we could have got away with that. She apparently decided she was going to take out everybody. I was sick. I was sick, sick. I got nauseous sick. Over killing your father or mother or both? The whole thing. My body stopped feeling numb. But I never did anything like that. I saw Ronnie DeFeo. He was quite crying. Say they, they, they rubbed out my whole family, you know? And um, I asked him to sit down and be, calm himself, you know? And he kept on insisting that it was a mafia rub out. And um, that, that, that didn't sound right to me because of the fact that they would have rubbed him out also. I was scared. My whole family is dead. I didn't kill him. How am I going to explain this? Mr. DeFeo, which was the grandfather, came up on the scene. And uh, both grandfathers were very heavy in the mafia. And he says, no way. We don't touch family. I can tell you straight out, I didn't care who they blamed it was as long as it wasn't me. I did not care. I didn't care then, and I don't care now. I didn't care who they blamed. We took him back to the homicide squad. We put him in a room with a two-way mirror with a cot in this room. He was to sleep in three, four minutes. He was out like a light. Then we all got together. So while he's sleeping, he rapidly became the chief suspect. When he woke up, two detectives, uh, they spoke to him. He had already confessed to a certain extent and that where he had thrown the gun, the clothes that he was wearing, he showered and uh, the towels he wiped himself off with. He all put him in a drain on his way to work in Brooklyn. position I was in. I told him a lot of things to get it up off me. I didn't want this coming back on me. Six people were dead. It was bad if one was dead. Yeah. No, I wasn't telling the truth either. I was lying. Because the only evidence in my case is, according to the police, is my mouth and them. These are the original autopsy reports. And for Ronald DeFeo Sr., 43 cause of death, massive internal and external hemorrhage due to bullet wounds of back homicide. Louise DeFeo, 42, bullet wounds of side and back, penetrating multiple viscera homicide. Dawn DeFeo, 18, bullet wound of head and brain homicide. Allison DeFeo, 13 years old, bullet wound of head and brain homicide. Mark Gregory DeFeo, 12, bullet wounds of back, homicide. John DeFeo, 9, bullet wound of back, penetrating multiple viscera, homicide. Tell me a little bit about your family. Father was a very rough person. I mean, he was a violent man. I got beat up since the day I was born. I mean, I know if they told me he took me out of a high chair and he threw me because I took a bowl of spaghetti and poured it over my head. It was a big joke when it happened until the mess had to get cleaned up and he flung me across the room. That was probably another one of the shots I took to my spine and my head because my spine is screwed up. He was 18 months, two years old, very, very young child. And they were at a, a family uh, wedding. And he was, as most two-year-olds, cranky and tired and carrying on. And his mother was trying to comfort him. And his father just whacked him against a, a, a chair. I think it was a folding chair. And, you know, that was the end of his crying. He was stunned. And I thought to myself, my God, from the age of 18 months or two years, this kid has been abused. 
horrible as his deeds are, nonetheless, you know, this was a, a case of abuse. He was violent throughout your relationship with him? Yeah, why since I've been born. So I was born. It never stopped. And did he treat your siblings the same way? Everybody. Everybody the same way. It was a crazy house. Somebody was always screaming at somebody in his house. The father would scream at the mother, the father would scream at all of them. The mother would scream at the daughter, the daughter would scream at the next in line, right on down the line until the little one had nobody to yell at. <laughs> and I know his sister was a bomb ready to go off too. With all the abuse she took in that house and everything from the father just screaming and yelling constantly. So anything could have happened. I, I think, yes, Dawn could have had a role in it. Tell me about your siblings. And I know there's Allison, Dawn. Mark and John. Well, tell me about your relationships with each of those people. We were all just really close, you know. We, you know, we had a lot of fun. We were wild, you know. I used to play with the two of my two brothers all the time. My mother used to come in there screaming. There was some show on TV, Batman, I believe it was back then. Mm -hmm. It don't matter where I was sitting, what I was doing, the two of them jump on me. They were fooling around. We used to tear the rooms up. i take them in the car, let them try to drive, you know, the steering wheel, I mean. They would have been ahead of their time, God rest their souls, if they would have been alive. Mark and John you're talking about. Oh, yeah, Dawn. I taught Dawn how to drive. Mm -hmm. I mean, they could say what they want. It was me that taught her to drive. I told her, yeah, get behind a wheel and drive. Something oh. special existed between Ronald DeFeo and his sister, Dawn. Now, some say that that was incest. I don't know. But there was a special connection, a special bond, perhaps a bond of secrecy. Yeah, the kids were real close. Real close, especially Allison and uh, my two brothers. But my father had to go. Not anybody else's sister. I was going to do this in the street. This wasn't going to get done in the house. And I was going to get somebody to do it. He would have got killed driving his car in Brooklyn somewhere. That's the way this was supposed to happen. But it got out of control. That night, things just happened. Anybody that knew him knew he was an outright junkie. He was never harmless because the drugs made him dangerous. Ronnie as Ronnie was harmless. But, you know, now you're talking five years of just basically living on heroin and drugs. That's got to take toll somewhere. When did you first start using street drugs? I used heroin. That's the first time I put a needle in my arm. I was scared of needles. How much were you using? Well, a lot. Real life. The dope was real good. Real good. I went and bought a thousand dollars worth in one day. It was so good. It lasted about a week. And I went to Scotch, and then I got crazy. I was drinking. This is the truth. For a good six months before I came to prison, I was up to a fifth of Scotch a day. I was drinking myself so. Three to six months leading up to the murders, you're drinking a fifth of Scotch a day. You're doing heroin on a daily basis. I was out of control. My own friends didn't want nothing to do. Okay. That's, That's not bad. Is that basically what you're doing, scotch and heroin? I had everything. But uh, I had, I was, what could I do? I couldn't do anything with it. It was like a dog on a long leash. And How does a dog on a long leash get off the leash? How do you get off? Well, in my opinion, the person that put you on a leash has to be removed. Eliminated. Let's now talk about the, the weeks leading up to the murders. My father broke a pool stick over my head. It was November 3rd. It was about 11 o'clock, a little after 11 at night. Your father He broke a pool stick over my head. My mother cheered him on. And what Hit him again. What happens after that? What happened? Here I am, and here you are. No, but there's there's a little bit that happened in between. Nothing happened in between. I made my mind up. That was it. You made your mind up that, that night? That was it. That you were going to kill your father? That was it. Not supposed to happen that way. I made my mind up. That was it. That was the last threat in the last episode. That was it. The man was trying to hurt me bad. He was going to kill me. 
no sign of any struggle with the exception of the young boy with the broken leg, Mark. The only thing we saw is he had the sheet and he was grabbing the sheet and he was pulling it down. Um, that was the only indication that he didn't die that quickly, you know. The bullet severed his spinal cord and one of the descriptions that Ronald DeFeo allegedly gave to the police was that after he fired the weapon, he saw his leg twitch. And that would have uh, been because the spinal cord had been severed and that would cause an involuntary reflex of uh, his foot twitching. The primary problem that I see looking at this case is you've gone from saying in open court that you killed six people. But at some later point now, there's a different story in which Don plays a... You know, you don't see, let me explain something. I'm not cutting you off. Well, I yeah. told him <laughs> in the courtroom that Don put, gave me the gun in my hand. At the trial. But I turned understand. it around and made it look like an act of insanity. And it yes, was in no. my mind. I understand. How is it that six people would be lying in bed? How is it that sick people would stay in bed? It is totally speculative, and I would say total fear. Uh, even that overcomes the idea that somebody's going to kill me. If some, I'm so frightened by what somebody says, or is so menacing that they say, do not move, and then I'm going to be riveted in that particular uh, place, even though I know the inevitable consequences are going to be that somebody's going to kill me. That's what they're doing to everybody else. So I would have to say fear would have to be the component there. He said the crime itself looks like a crazy man had to do it. Somebody out of their mind had to kill the whole family. He said, this is what you got to do, and that's what I did. He said so many things that, uh, you know, after a while, you begin to wonder what, what's real and what's not real. It was easy to write him off because he was such a liar and manipulator. He told more, I can't even remember, but he must have given about six or seven different versions of what happened. A change in stories was part of the insanity. You cannot go in the courtroom and, and stay on one track. If you stay on one track, you're not insane. You're very intelligent and know what you're doing. That was part of the insanity. I don't know, is that insanity? I don't think it, I don't think that's the definition. Uh, that, I think that's part of the bravado that I saw. I don't know. <laughs> it's uh, a bag of worms, no matter how you slice it. Consciousness of guilt, the fact that the evidence was carefully picked up and secreted by him, the fact that he took the rifle and threw it into the waters of the Great South Bay. All of this indicated his knowledge that what he had done was wrong, both in a legal sense and in a moral sense. I actually felt sorry. I mean, when that trial was over, I was in tears, as so were many of the other jurors. It was a horrible situation. This boy grew up almost, it was like predestined that he was going to be a problem. And uh, it's very sad. I mean, as a human being, He's a human being, and I, you know, it, I just found it very disturbing. And you're in an all one situation. You are in society, and I'm going to tell you why. Everybody is scared, and you know what you're all afraid of? You know I did this with other people, and you're all afraid to deal with reality. From day one, I told every attorney that Dawn was involved in this crime. What do you mean? I said, Dawn is involved in this crime. Then they went and checked the nightgown, and the investigator said he's telling the truth. There's unburned powder. That means she fired a fire up. I mean, see, I don't know if they need hearing aids or they need seeing eye dogs, because the point is, your investigator just told you there's unburned powder on the front of a nightgown, which means she had to discharge a fire up. Don DeFeo's night clothes show unburned powder, which indicates she may have fired a rifle that night. I wasn't letting her or anybody else stick a gun to my face. And that's exactly what she did. I lost my temper and killed her. That's not murder. I'm not innocent, but I'm not guilty of this whole crime. But your explanation is that the other person was Don. I wasn't there, and you're never going to get me uh, to change that. So it could have been someone else. 
Why, why would somebody else want to do that? Right. I'm just tired of you intelligent people like yourself with all the years of college you got not sitting down in the lab examining and looking how the f*** could the fail done all that by himself. The DA knows and everybody knows I didn't do this by myself and they know that Dawn the fail was a perpetrator in this crime. All, all the pieces to the puzzle are there. In fact, the jury found Ronald DeFeo to be guilty of all the murders and to be of sound mind. He was given six life sentences in February 1975. The DeFeo home at 112 Ocean Avenue was put up for sale at a knockdown price because of its ghastly history. It was then that George and Kathleen Lutz, newlyweds with a young family, went to view the house and the next extraordinary chapter of the Amityville horror began. We discussed the events that had happened in the house as a family and came to the decision that we would all be okay with the history of what had happened. But I don't think any of us considered the possibility that there would be something residual there. According to the Lutzes, there were unsettling occurrences from the very beginning. Harry tried to hang himself, our dog, our black Labrador retriever. He jumped over the fence and his chain was too short, and he was actually hanging on the wrong side of the fence, choking to death. That was all within the first hour of, of moving in. George Lutz then says that a good friend who knew the history of the house strongly advised him to have it blessed. The priest came and went about the house blessing, came out and told Kathy and I not to use the one upstairs bedroom we were going to use as a sewing room as a bedroom. He said he felt something in there. And he was slapped. He heard a voice tell him to get out. Those were two things that were immediate first day, first few hours. Within the first few days, George Lutz claims he found himself waking regularly at 3.15 in the morning, feeling restless, uneasy, and often hearing strange noises. Significantly, this was the time when the DeFeo murders were estimated to have taken place. I got very sick in the house and lost a lot of weight, lost days at work. Um, my own personal hygiene changed there. He was undergoing personality changes. He would snap at the family. He and Kathy were having arguments. He could not get warm. He was constantly outside chopping wood, building fires. Kathy would go to different rooms in the house and feel different things. She was embraced by what she felt was someone, a woman. When she told me about it, she was quite frightened and quite disturbed by it. The Lutzes reported swarms of houseflies infesting certain rooms, highly unusual in midwinter. They were also becoming increasingly anxious about the behavior of their daughter, Missy. Missy started to explain to Kathy that she had a friend, the friend's name was Jody, that it represented itself to her as a large pig. When Jody told her that he was glad she was there and she was going to be living there forever, that was quite disturbing. As the days went past, the Lutzes claimed that more and more strange things were happening around them. When you hear screams at night and you hear footsteps at night and the kids are saying strange things and the temperatures in the house vary and the spots that would appear in the carpet in the morning, um, the progression of certain toilets turning black the China actually turning black. When you sit down and you start talking about those, then there's obviously something wrong. They still don't like to talk about what happened that very last night that finally drove them from the house. I will never be able to set aside what had gone on that night, all night, and the boys where they looked and what they said when they came down that morning. Come on, babies, come on, come on, get out. The Lutz family say they finally fled from the house in the early morning of January 14th, 1976. They would never return. We did not move in the, and move out as the same family. All of us were quite frightened by the time we left. And knew of no fear when we moved in. And the fear alone was something that 
changed all of us. With the Lutzes underground, interest in the Amateurville horror story was building, and New York TV station Channel 5 were determined to get the scoop. I got in touch with George Lutz and said, your family needs help, because they, they were clearly terrified. Laura called in a celebrated pair of psychic investigators based in Connecticut, Ed and Lorraine Warren. The type of work that we do is investigation into the paranormal, the supernatural, the preternatural, from haunting phenomena caused by human spirits or through poltergeist activity or the demonic inhuman hauntings. We've worked on numerous possession cases and exorcisms and Warner Brothers has the rights to our life. It was a horribly foreboding type of a feeling throughout the whole house. You knew that this house was infested by something other than human spirits. That's for sure. That was more than obvious. When the Lutz family claimed that their home in Amityville was possessed, a local TV station assembled a team of psychics and arranged to film their investigation of the house. They got parapsychologists, they brought in some other psychics, and it was arranged to go in there on the night of March 6, 1976. Soon after the Channel 5 news team and their reporter Marvin Scott arrived at the house, people began behaving unusually. Nothing happened to me, but things were happening to people around me. The way people were affected was just crazy. First thing that happened, our cameraman, Steve, got to the landing on the second floor, and all of a sudden he bent over, clutching his chest. He had stabbing chest pains. The overwhelming impression was very sad. I had the impression of a teenager who had done something that had changed his life entirely, and he had committed something horrendous. When we went up to the second floor, of course, the psychics could feel the remnants or the bad vibes. Six people had been murdered violently there, you know, not two years before. There was a window above me, and I saw a face of a young girl looking out at me. And then I heard crying, weeping. So I said, look to the white light, walk towards it, and everybody you love is waiting for you. Lorraine, during the seance, said that she felt like there was some evil here that was from the bowels of the earth. It was not just the murdered spirits of the dead DeFeos. I could see bodies all lined up, all with white sheets over them. I got the impression of, like, hooded figures, like monks, right outside the door, closing the door well, looking in at me. I thought, uh-oh. I get to the top and I go into a room and Marvin Scott said to me, what is it? What is it? I said to him, I hope this is as close to hell as I'll ever get. So I took the holy water and I opened it and I said to him, get thee behind me, Satan. And I went like that and you could hear like water on a hot stove go tss. And then everything in the house stopped. After the seance was over, we proceeded downstairs. At that point, Ed had his crucifix and he was leading the rain. He stopped at one point, almost as if he was like thrown back by a gust of wind. And, and he later described it as being assailed by, I think, a legion of demons. It's like the rush of water against my chest, holding you back so powerfully. Again. As a reporter, I have to tell you, I did not see anything, I did not feel anything other than the reaction of Ed, Lorraine, the other psychics, and the other people around me. At two in the morning, I remember Marvin Scott turning to me and saying, we don't have it. In other words, this was not the exorcist for television. Although nothing happened for the TV cameras, one photograph taken that night would later apparently reveal a mysterious presence. The camera was set up in a tripod and it just automatically shot off a flash photograph every few moments. And there were rolls and rolls of film of this particular doorway that was into our daughter's room. 
The photographs were being cataloged by a secretary I had years later in California, and she was pregnant. And every time she picked up this one particular picture, the baby inside her jumped. And lo and behold, on the second floor in the doorway of one room, there is the distinct figure of a little boy peering out from the doorway. There were no children in the house that night. So it's like, okay, where did this come from? And we called Missy and asked her, who was this? And she said, oh, that's the boy I used to play with there. First we had heard of that. The Lutzes never returned to 112 Ocean Avenue. The bank reclaimed the property and their possessions were auctioned off. George and Kathy moved to California, claiming that they needed to escape the influence of the house and the glare of publicity as their story gathered momentum. On January the 13th, 1977, Holzer, William Weber, and Laura DiDio entered the house with renowned deep trance medium, Ethel Johnson Myers. The only thing you need is a good deep trance medium so that if an entity is present, they can use the vocal cords of the medium to, to make a conversation with me. It's very eerie and quite shocking to see the physical transformation that this woman underwent. As soon as we got out of the car, before we even entered the house, she said, there's an Indian around here. All of a sudden, she developed an Adam's apple. After a while, this lady began talking in a strange jabberish language. Her voice dropped several octaves. And she was talking with an Indian chief who was buried on that land. Why are they angry? Because it's been a sacred place, and this is over the very, very special chief. Oh, I can't move my face. This turned out to be an Indian cemetery uh, that had been used to build houses on, very much to the dismay of the Indian who was buried there. And what does he make them do? Violence of death. I don't know, my skull's cracked and my neck's stretched. What will the male do under those circumstances? Anything the Indian desires him to do. Despite the fact that the people have said it's the most haunted house in America, it is not a truly haunted house. There are no ghosts there, there are no spirits there, except the Indian chief. And what he wanted, from his point of view, was get off my land. The book, for whatever reason, took off. I can't describe how quickly. It became an instant bestseller. I think their initial printing was 25,000 books, and they had never printed anything even close to that with the first printing. And it sold out as soon as it reached the bookstores. It was rather uh, quite phenomenal. It was clear that this story of a haunted house had the power to captivate millions. The idea that this actually happened to people makes those people closer because if it's not out of somebody's imagination, then it's real and could really happen to them. A home is supposed to be where you're safe. And the Amityville Horror destroys all that, that safe thinking. This happened right after William Peter Blatty's book, The Exorcist, and the movie The Exorcist came out circa 1973-74. There seemed to be a hunger, a longing, perhaps maybe even kind of a, a spiritual question that was looming large about good versus evil. Even people who professed to be agnostic or atheists were sleeping with the lights on after going to see that movie, clutching crucifixes, and running back to church. It seemed to provide a climate in which Amityville could breed. The house itself had now become a personality, thanks to its distinctive top floor windows. Everybody that said to me, what did you think about those two eyes? The eyes that watch you. I mean, I've heard this a lot. They became the eyes of the house, you know, and if you look at it, you say, that house is looking at me, and that gave it this evil persona. Something's watching, something's hidden, something's watching. The next incarnation of the Lutz's story came when Amateurville got the Hollywood treatment. What happened to them 
is an experience in terror you will never forget. And you will believe in the Amityville horror. Within a week, Kathy's hand had been touched by something that we discussed and couldn't explain. It was just something unseen. We also had hordes of flies that would appear within two rooms. And no matter how many times we would kill them, they would reappear. When they sold those books and the motion picture came out, all hell broke loose. It was a media frenzy. I mean, people just descended on the village of Amityville. People from Ireland, people from England, people from all over Europe. They were plagued, not by ghosts inside or demons, but by tourists. In the rainstorms and thunderstorms, as many as 50 people standing there with their hands together, uh, just looking at the house like it was a religion. On Ocean Avenue, people's lawns were just crushed with people parking their cars and trying to get to the horror house. I had busloads. People in my backyard picnicking, nuns from Sweden. They got stuck on my driveway. I don't know how they even got down my driveway. People running up and wanting to grab a piece of the house, pulling up a piece of the lawn, taking off a piece of the siding of the house. One woman hit a cop over the head so hard with a pocketbook, she almost knocked him out. Anything so that they could go and peer into the windows and really be annoying. It just went on and on and on. But just as thousands of tourists seemed convinced by the Amityville story, so there were growing numbers who suspected a hoax. We had 116 obvious errors, physical errors, in the book. And that's before you get down to floating pigs. There was a picture that Missy had drawn, one of the lush children, of Jody, the demonic pig, that she said would often appear up on the second floor window so with its red eyes peering in. We started talking to some of the neighbors, and one of the neighbors said to us, oh, what, what does it look like? And we showed the picture that was in the book, and they said, oh, that's the cat that Ronald DeFeo called the pig, because he was fat. Well, the pig happened to be my, my wife had a Persian cat. And I, it was a Persian cat, I'm sure. <coughs> this cat would actually jump up into the window and stand there and stare with those red glowing eyes. And what about those infamous flies? My God, the murder took place. The victims were removed after 48 hours. The house was then sealed up and the heat was on. Just doesn't take a brain scientist to figure out how you end up with flies. As part of their investigation, Jordan and Moran interviewed Jim and Barbara Cromarty, who bought the house after the Lutzes left. We asked them if when they moved into the house they had made any major repairs. Because if you read the book, it, you get the impression that this whirlwind of paranormal activity sweeps through the house and leaves it in a state of shambles. George Lutz tried Don't to say that the Everything window was in, perfect in the house shape had slammed down on his son's and hand their... and he had taken him to Brunswick Hospital to be treated. So my husband said, well, we'll just subpoena the records of Brunswick Hospital, and then you can prove that. And he said, well, I didn't really take him to the hospital. We bandaged it at home. So the story would change if you tried to pin him down. Well, I remember when we walked into one of the rooms, there was a window where it was claimed. If you stood in the center of the room, the window would suddenly open and shut violently all by itself. It was on the second floor. So we ran into this room, Rick and I, and Rick pointed out that the floorboards seemed to be slightly uneven. And he started shifting his foot along the floor. And suddenly, the window shot up. I thought I was going to jump out of my shoes backwards. I shrieked. The counterweights are improperly set. And the window was such that if you did this, you could actually make this window go up and then come down. Confusion surrounds much of this. Um, I don't know that it did. <laughs> <laughs> that it will ever be undone in talking about evil. Peter Jordan and Rick Moran confronted Anson with their evidence that the book was not a true story, but a work of fiction. He said, you're one of those naysayers. You're a skeptic who likes to write non-ghost stories. I like to make money. Jay said to me, I'm a writer. My only interest is to write a best-selling book so that I can build a house in Mayorka and never have to write again. And one day I predict, he said, that you are going to be sitting there broke, writing your little non-ghost stories 
and I'm going to be in an island out in the Bahamas or somewhere with a truckload of cashmere sweaters. And I remember thinking it was the funniest thing. And I started cackling and he said, what's so funny? And I said, that is the most ridiculous fantasy that any millionaire could ever have. And then after that, I was coming home from somewhere out in Long Island, had the radio on, and Jay Anson, author of the Amityville Horror, suffered a uh, tragic heart attack today. And I thought, oh, he never got to enjoy that truckload of cashmere sweaters. Although he never had time to enjoy it, Anson made millions from Amityville in comparison with the Lutzes, whose share was said to be only $250,000. However, George still stands by the author and the book. He had the most difficult of jobs to explain something he didn't believe in or understand. And he managed a very, very accurate book compared to anything else that's ever been done since. And since Kathy Lutz's premature death earlier this year, he must now do this alone. She and I experienced this together. And we moved past it together. And we tried to explain it to the world, if you will, together. Her passing means I lost my partner of that experience. That doesn't give license to anyone to create some kind of revisionist history now of what she had to say while she was alive. But there are some who say that Kathy's death is the most recent example of the evil influence of the house in Amityville. One of the things that happened to her in the house is she looked into the mirror and she saw this this old lady in the mirror. She died in Phoenix of a disease, of, of a respiratory disease that caused her to age about 30 years. So when she passed away, she was really, she really looked very old. I wasn't really concerned about whether or not it was a true story. It didn't matter to me. Uh, I had to create uh, a reality of my own. I'm coming apart! Oh, mother of God, I'm coming apart! It affected Ronald to fail, one way. It affected the Lutzes, another way. It affects everybody that goes into that house. I think that uh, they had this whole thing planned, and they were going to write a book about it and make themselves a lot of money. And, you know, they did. They weren't there. They didn't live it. They didn't experience it and yet they would explain it to you. And that's really a disservice to everyone. Unless we get a spirit who actually shows up and explains it on camera, which I doubt is going to happen, we're not going to know. So we will keep pursuing the elusive thing, whatever that thing is. It's the most documented event of its kind in terms of how many people were involved, how many people witnessed on their own or saw their own or have had their testimony unchanged for all these years. The absence of God's presence, and as such, then confusion is going to be part of that.